Good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar titled Suicide Prevention in Later Life, Connecting and Contributing, sponsored by SAMHSA and presented under TA Coalition contract by the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, also known as NASHBID. My name is Kelly Mastin from NASHBID, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we introduce today's presenter, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording along with the PowerPoint presentation slides will be available on the NASHBID website at www.nasmhpd.org within three days. For participants only, audio is being streamed through your computer speakers with no need to connect by phone unless necessary in which case we have the phone number listed in the notes section on your screen. If you're having any technical difficulties during this webinar, please type your comment in the Q&A pod on the right side of your screen and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions at, sorry, please also type your questions in the Q&A pod and at the end of the presentation, we will ask as many as we can. The PowerPoint slides are available at the top of your screen where it says PowerPoint Slides. Please click on Upload File to download the presentation. We will have a short evaluation at the end of the webinar for you to give us feedback. Please also know that we do not offer CEU credit for our webinars, but we will send you a letter of attendance upon request. My email address will be available at the top of the screen during the evaluation. I would like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today, and again, thank you for joining us. Today's presenter is Dr. Kim Van Orden. Dr. Van Orden is a clinical psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Rochester School of Medicine. She is also the Associate Director of a Research Fellowship in Suicide Prevention at the University of Rochester that is funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. She received her PhD from Florida State University and completed a pre-doctoral internship at Montefiore Medical Center and a post-doctoral fellowship at the University of Rochester. Her research and clinical interests are in the promotion of social connectedness to prevent late life su uh, suicide. Excuse me. Much of her work is grounded by psychological theory, including the interpersonal theory of suicide, which she, had, which she helped develop, refine, and test. Her research is funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute on Aging, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Her current and recent projects examine behavioral interventions to reduce suicide risk in later life via the mechanism of increasing social connectedness. Kim also mentors students and postdoctoral fellows and maintains an active clinical practice providing evidence-based psychotherapy to older adults. Kim, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here today to tell you about uh, some of the work that I'm doing um, around that topic of social connectedness as a mechanism to prevent suicide in older adults. So I will go ahead and get us started. And I'm going to try to leave um, as much time as possible at the end for questions, because I really would like this to be as interactive as a webinar can be. So a uh, disclaimer just to start out that these are my views that I'll speak about, um, not those of SAMHSA or HHS. And then I have some disclosures as well um, in terms of research funding. Uh, you can see the grants there. And uh, as with most science, it's team science. So I want to thank all the mentors and collaborators I've been fortunate enough to work with, uh, as well as the fabulous uh, research coordinators who have really made this work possible. So we'll start out with the learning objectives to help us get grounded in what we're going to speak about today. Uh, so what I hope you're able to walk away from uh, after this webinar um, would be sort of an understanding of at least two of the challenges to preventing suicide in older adults that illustrate the importance of upstream prevention, meaning catching older people 
hopefully before they become suicidal. Uh, as well, I'd uh, like to help you understand some of the reasons why targeting social relationships uh, has particular promise as an upstream suicide prevention for older adults. And then finally, I'd like you to walk away with some practical strategies that you can use in your work, um, either directly or with folks that you might supervise in terms of making, uh, improving relationships among the folks you work with uh, to help them improve their quality of life and also reduce suicide risk. So I want to start with um, an example. Um, this is an example that uh, my mentor, Yates Conwell, um, taught me about. Um, and it's, it's particularly relevant for where I live right now, which is Rochester, New York. And you may know that the founder of Kodak, uh, George Eastman, uh, lived in Rochester. You may also know that George Eastman died by suicide at the age of 77. Um, he died of a fatal gunshot wound to the chest. And what you see there um, in the text at the top of the slide, as well as in the photo, it's a little tricky to read, um, is the simple note he left. Um, and you can see that note if you visit his home um, in Rochester, which is now a museum. They do keep it tucked away, uh, given that this is a sensitive topic. So his note simply said, my work is done, why wait? So a pretty provocative statement. It, it brings up a lot of, I think, emotions and thoughts in people. And so what I would like to do um, is actually do a couple polls. I unfortunately skipped the first one, so I want to take a minute. Um, I have a poll that goes with this one, but I want to ask a question first. Um, to give me a sense of, of who you all are. So if we could um, go to the first poll, yeah, that asks, um, so how many of you work clinically with older adults, either supervising others, seeing patients yourself, um, in any capacity? So it looks like, um, so I'll let folks um, take a second in case you're not quite sure how to enter that stuff in yet. Um, but it looks like the pretty hefty portion of our listeners on the webinar do work directly with older people, um, including either supervising or direct clinical work themselves. OK, that's great. And so um, this may be some of the introductory material, maybe things you're familiar with. But I hope we get to a way where we can expand upon what you already know and bring some of that information to your work. OK, so we will go ahead and switch to the next poll, which is directly related to this suicide note. So, so the question here is there's obviously no right or wrong answer. But I want you to think about for a moment is, given his note, should we have prevented George Eastman's suicide? So his note was, my work is done. Why wait? So should his suicide have been prevented? looks like a lot of the results have come in. And I, I think you all can see this, that the vast majority of you all, uh, about looks like about 87% think that his suicide should have been presented. But a rather sizable uh, proportion, around 12, 13%, uh, think no, think that he should, uh, that necessarily, not necessarily should we have prevented his suicide. Um, so unfortunately, I can't have us have a discussion about, about why um, you feel that way. And there's no right answer. But I do want to um, give a little bit more context to his note, which may or may not change the way you think about this. But um, you know, it's a very important thing to consider. Sometimes when I give these talks, uh, people will say, well, of course he wanted to die. He's old. So it's a really important thing to, to think about um, in the context of, of older adults in particular. So we'll go back to the slides now. Um, so my work is done. Why wait? So people, uh, some people interpret that, um, that note as saying that he you know, has lived a full life. He was very successful in terms of his work. And he was choosing to end his life on his own terms. He was asserting his autonomy. And in that way, some people say that his suicide was an act of an autonomous man. And it wasn't necessarily 
a completely negative thing. On the flip side, um, if you add a little bit more context to this, uh, George Eastman um, was living alone, uh, likely suffered from depression. He had quite a bit of pain. He had a spinal condition and um, was wheelchair bound, so quite a bit of functional impairment. And as we'll speak about later, all of those things are actually what we see as the constellation of risk factors for suicide in later life. So um, not saying, uh, yes, we should have prevented or no, we shouldn't have. But when you look a little bit deeper, uh, you can see that there were many, many risk factors for suicide in later life. So we'll keep going. Um, and I do want to highlight that um, suicide is not an expected or normal response to the stressors of aging. So setting aside uh, whether you think it should or should not be uh, prevented, we can say that it's not the normative response. If we look at uh, the, the psychology of aging, the vast majority of older people do not become depressed in later life and certainly do not engage in suicidal behavior. Uh, so important to keep in mind working with our patients uh, that this is not something that is an inevitable uh, outcome. So this, the real takeaway um, from my webinar today is pretty simple, that suicide in later life is a big clinical concern and a public health concern. We'll unpack that a bit as we go along. And importantly, that social connections are key to suicide prevention. Um, a really important part of quality of life that often doesn't get as much attention, I think, as it deserves. So significance there refers to the significance of the problem of late life suicide. And so we know that older adults are the most rapidly growing segment of the population. Uh, population aging is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, we also know from the data that older adults have higher rates of suicide than other segments of the population. And I'll break that down for you in a bit uh, with a graph. But data from the World Health Organization um, clearly shows that if you look around the world, um, suicide rates increase with age. There's also some compelling work um, by some epidemiologists, um, in particular uh, Julie Phillips, her work suggests that this problem may actually increase over time. It looks like the baby boomers and subsequent cohorts are actually bringing with them higher suicide rates. So what that can mean if these predictive models are correct is that as we take a higher risk group and have them enter later life, which is a higher risk time period, the problem may be even greater. We also know that suicidal behavior is more lethal in later life. And so what that means is that there's a range of, of what we might call suicidal behavior, including an attempt. So attempts are more likely to result in death among older adults. So uh, suicidal behavior um, in younger people, they may survive um, or they may not go through with the attempt. Uh, but older adults are more likely than younger people to die on their first attempt. And so why is that the case? Um, there are several explanations, being that physical frailty may be more likely uh, to result in death. Um, older adults, on average, tend to be more isolated, so um, less likely to be rescued. And then what I would argue is most important in terms of accounting for this lethality is that they are more planful and determined in their suicidal behavior. In the US, that means more likely to use firearms. So what does this imply? It implies that our intervention should be aggressive. And what I mean there, I'm using the Institute of Medicine terminology in terms of uh, how we class, classify interventions as indicated, selective, and universal. So indicated is, is roughly what we might call treatment, such as psychotherapy for depression, um, medications for depression. And then distal prevention, what I'm uh, targeting or calling selective and universal, is where we take a more public health approach and we try to address the risk factors that place someone on a trajectory towards suicidal behavior. And one of the sort of key points from my webinar today 
is that distal prevention is especially relevant when we think about preventing suicide in older people because of the lethality of that behavior. And so optimal um, suicide prevention. Uh, before we get to that, I think I did have a uh, poll. So I'm going to go back so you can't, uh, can't answer based on that slide. So um, let's go ahead to the next poll, which I have up for you guys. Yeah. So again, there's no right answer for this, but take a moment and think about it. Given what we know about the high lethality of suicide attempts in later life, think about those three options and which would you pick as a promising intervention strategy? So say you have a pot of money and you can allocate it to one of those three, which would you pick? So increased screening for suicidal thoughts in primary care and training primary care providers. Um, the second option is interventions for targeting risk factors for suicide to prevent older adults for, from becoming suicidal or improving psychotherapies to more effectively engage older men. So it looks like we're getting close to um, having folks have entered their responses. So um, I'll just I'll start with the bottom one, actually. Um, so improving psychotherapy is to more effectively engage men. We have about 3% of people endorsing that one. And I, I put that one because it makes a lot of sense because uh, most of the interventions we have for older people have been shown to be effective in women. And we know that men are actually at greatest risk. At the same time, we know that older adults are less likely to seek care in our mental health clinics where those type of psychotherapies are uh, typically provided. So my argument would be that that may be a slightly less potentially promising uh, strategy than the others, but um, you, know, there's, you can make an argument for any of them. Um, and then, uh, so the one that I would argue um, is potentially most effective is the one that I'm taking so I'm obviously biased, which is the middle one, interventions targeting risk factors. So my work looks at targeting social connectedness to prevent older adults from hopefully entering a suicidal crisis, given that those suicidal crises are often fatal in later life. Um, so that's kind of the idea of that, that middle one. Um, and I hope to convince some of you as we go through the webinar that that is a promising strategy. And then the top one we could spend you know, the rest of the webinar discussing. Uh, we know that um, older adults who die by suicide um, are very likely to have been seen in the months and weeks before their death in primary care. So primary care is a very important setting for preventing suicide in later life. Um, so it makes a lot of sense that we would want to direct uh, our attention there. And I will say I do most of my recruitment for my projects in primary care because that is such an important setting. Just as food for thought, um, the uh, US Preventive Task Force, as of now, does not recommend screening for suicidal thoughts outside uh, elevated depression. And that's, that's a really complicated issue, but in part because uh, we haven't linked screening to effective care. We don't really have many evidence-based interventions for suicide. There are, I believe, three randomized trials worldwide ever that have shown an effect on suicide deaths. So while it makes sense to screen, if you think about uh, the criteria that are used for selecting what a primary care provider might screen for, one of them is that we are able to treat it. So I think that's, that's kind of the rationale. It's very sort of controversial when we think about it. Um, but hopefully it's something we can aspire to, something we can um, get to, sh show that we have interventions that can save lives, and hopefully get to a place where we're able to implement all three of those. OK, so we will go ahead and move back to the slides. And I do see there's some questions, and I hope we can get to those at the end. I'm going to leave enough time for that. So lethality. Um, so we will move on to our next slide, which is um, we're going to build on that idea. So optimal suicide prevention. This is obviously you know my viewpoint, uh, but the idea here is the idea of a multi-layered strategy. So um, ideally, like I said, picking all three of those that we included in the poll. So absolutely doing indicated prevention or treatment where we 
detect suicidal thoughts, we detect depression, we treat it aggressively. Uh, selective, where we um, intervene on risk factors like uh, physical functioning, social connectedness. And then universal, uh, one of my uh, mentors and colleagues calls it the speed bumps for suicide prevention. And so that would be education to reduce ageism. We know that holding negative perceptions of aging for yourself is really detrimental for your health, um, as well as um, having our society change those viewpoints and uh, promoting firearm safety. Very uh, topical issue at the moment. So uh, the red circle is uh, circling that one because that's what we're going to focus on today. And so one of the things I'd like you to take away from today is that late life suicide is in part a problem of social disconnectedness. So there's lots of different ways to operationalize or uh, there's lots of components or types of social disconnectedness. And there are many, many of them that are linked to suicide in later life. So I'll show you just a few here. Um, we know that loss of a spouse is linked to increased risk for suicide in later life, um, as is feeling lonely. Um, and the, increase, uh, the evidence there is increasing quite a bit. There are many more studies than I have listed there as a citation. Interpersonal discord, so having um, connections, but maybe they're not meeting your needs because they're uh, stressful or negative. Uh, low social support is a big one as well as not having a confidant, less community engagement, so not being engaged in, say, a church or a volunteer organization, as well as living alone. So social connectedness, in addition to potentially being linked directly to suicidal behavior through those uh, studies I showed you in the previous slide, um, is likely also linked to suicide in later life through some other uh, risk factors. So what I'm showing you here are some of those key risk factors for suicide in later life, including some that I talked about with George Eastman. And so social connectedness is robustly linked to all of these in prospective studies. So people who are more socially connected have better mental health, um, lower depression, less hopelessness, fewer suicidal thoughts, greater well-being. Um, Improved cognition, so in later life, social disconnectedness is linked to uh, development of memory problems, development of executive functioning problems, um, lower risk for dementia. Um, physical health, both in terms of when you ask people to rate their health, um, people who are connected will perceive their health as better. And then also objective indicators of health in terms of the presence or absence of, of numerous different types of diseases. And then functioning, which is so important to older adults. Um, so function status in terms of mobility, self-care, and strength, all are better in older adults who report connectedness. So connectedness could have some really powerful effects, not just on suicide directly via these other mechanisms. And of course, all of the, the, the circles I have here on the slide are important in and of themselves. So we may be able to really change someone's health trajectory if we can improve connectedness. Of course, that is an empirical question, and um, we need more research to demonstrate that. Um, and I, I think a lot of us have clinical experience seeing that that is the case. Um, so hopefully we can all marshal that together and make a difference. So here are suicide rates broken down a little bit. Um, many of you may have seen this, but there are kind of two lines that um, pop out in terms of high rates. So what you're seeing on the x-axis is age, and you get older to the right. And then suicide rates on the y-axis, so higher is uh, more suicides. Uh, and so you can see that um, green line, that is uh, younger uh, Native American men, so very high rates there. And then the blue line stands out as well, where you can see that's older white men. And once we get to um, what we might call older, older age, 85 and above, we see really, really high rates um, in older white men. And like I mentioned before, unfortunately, the interventions we have for late life suicide seem to be mostly effective for women uh, who are at much lower risk. Um, I'm going to address one of the questions I see over there in terms of is isolation among aging populations growing in its frequency. 
you know, that's a really interesting question and I think a really tough one to answer. And depending on who you ask, you'll get, get a different answer. Um, so isolation in terms of living alone, um, in terms of not living with families, absolutely is becoming more common. Is loneliness becoming more common? Tricky to say. Um, it's such an interesting construct. Depending on how you ask the question, you will get very different answers. So if you ask someone, do you feel lonely, um, many will not answer that affirmatively, likely because of stigma. If you use a scale that doesn't use the word loneliness, you get a much higher endorsement. And then there's the issue of whether um, it increases with age as well as over time, so cohorts. Um, it's, it's really tricky. If you look at, it's different if you look at uh, severe loneliness versus moderate loneliness. So um, with, uh, if you look over, over the lifespan, um, whether you see increases depends a lot on how you operationalize loneliness. So my own takeaway is that it does not tend to increase with age. It may as you get to the very, very later portions of life, so where we're looking at the 85 plus. Um, but it really varies on how we define it. So all of the studies tend to have very different definitions of isolation and loneliness. And so the picture is really quite confusing. Um, but you can see worldwide we have a lot of perceptions that it's increasing. So for example, the UK has a, um, a minister of loneliness, so they really want to tackle that problem as a public health issue because it's becoming, they think, more, um, more of a problem. Um, unclear whether it's a problem that we're just paying more attention to versus something that is increasing in frequency. Uh, but thanks for that question. It's a, it's a great one we could spend a lot of time on. I will keep going so we can get to some other things. Um, so here's a, a quote that really guides a lot of my research, that there's nothing so practical as a good theory. I'm going to spend just a minute describing a psychological theory of suicidal behavior um, that is uh, informs a lot of my work. It's called the Interpersonal Theory of Suicide. And it has three uh, components that sort of describe it in a nutshell. And that's what I'll do here. Um, the circles, uh, the size of them are supposed to represent just how common they are thought to be in the population. So thwarted belonging is the idea that we all have an innate need to belong to um, important relationships or groups, feel connected to and cared about like we belong. And when that need is unmet, uh, a lot of health problems uh, occur, including uh, risk for suicide. And so one of the causes, according to the theory of thinking about or wanting to die by suicide, is having this need to belong unmet. The other is feeling like a burden on others. And you hear that quite a bit in later life, uh, people, especially the fear of becoming a burden. Um, but the theory says it's, it's most dangerous with regards to thinking about suicide when someone's perceptions of burden get more extreme, where they start to think, not only am I a burden, I'm so much of a burden that the other the people in my life would be better off if I were gone. And when those two intersect, when you feel like you don't really belong to a group and that you're a burden, the theory says you're most likely to have active suicidal thoughts. And then the capability component uh, really has to do with the idea of uh, that thinking or wanting to die by suicide, thankfully, isn't enough. It's really scary. It's really painful. And most people can't engage in suicidal behavior, even if part of them wants to. And so individuals have to acquire this capability um, through various means. Um, one example would be a previous attempt. And then the theory says you're most at risk to die by suicide when all three of those are present. So my work really targets those two colored uh, circles, belonging and burden. Um, we're not so sure about capability in terms of its malleability to change, uh, but there are people who are really focusing on that. But I'm going to talk to you about these internal perceptions of, of connectedness. So what I have here is um, the model that I use for interventions to to sort of take the theory and apply it to what we might be able to do with behavioral interventions to hopefully reduce suicide risk. So thinking about what we're targeting, um, I tend to do approaches that target behaviors. Um, so while belonging and burden you might think of as thoughts or cognitions, um, we also know that we can change how we think and how we feel by changing our behaviors. 
And there is quite a bit of data showing that um, in all ages, but in particular among older adults, taking a behavioral approach can be um, very, very effective. And so my work looks to increase social engagement as a way to hopefully then change perceptions of belonging and perceived burden and thereby reduce suicide risk indicators such as ideation, quality of life, and meaning in life. And so I'm going to spend um, the rest of the time going through um, a couple examples of interventions. And what we'll do is we'll keep in mind uh, this um, case illustration, obviously uh, changed for uh, details so that it's not identifiable. But we'll say his name is Ed, um, and he is a 72-year-old white male. He lives alone. He has increasing disability. He recently had to give up driving, uh, may have depression and social isolation. So a therapist or a care manager uh, visited his home and talked to him. He reported having a few social acquaintances, but no close friends. Um, he seemed to have mild depression on a PHQ-9. And then the case manager made some behavioral observations. That he rarely smiled, quite a bit of flat affect, um, monotone, things like that, and was, was pretty negative in how he spoke. So thinking about that, how could we help Ed? What strategies could we use? So I'm going to give you some examples of things that we could try and things that I'm doing some work on. And so one is peer companionship. And uh, there are nationwide programs. Many of you likely know about them, may even uh, work in those programs through uh, the Area Association on Aging, as well as through our Senior Corps program, which is the older adult version of AmeriCorps, which I think is fantastic. And so there are programs where older adults uh, visit other older adults and provide companionship. So my mentor, Yates Conwell, and I um, did a study. He was the principal investigator on this study that was um, funded by the CDC um, called the Senior Connection. And these are photos from other senior companion programs. And what we wanted to do was get some data or, or test a hypothesis that this existing program, which is already available nationwide, may have some really promising effects on suicide risk, um, but it hasn't been documented. Um, and it may not be uh, being provided to all of the people who need it in primary care, for example. So we wanted to recruit older adults from primary care and um, conduct a study to see if companionship would reduce suicide risk. So, um, so this was a randomized trial where half of the older people um, received companionship and half did not. Uh, half received just care as usual with their primary care doctor. To be entered into the study, um, an older person, so at least 60, had to re report feeling lonely, and it was a direct question, I feel lonely, uh, or feel like a burden on others. So we were grounding ourselves in the interpersonal theory of suicide by using those as inclusion criteria. Uh, so then we gave them a companion for um, up to two years. I'm going to present results on the one-year follow-up. And we asked that the volunteers, um, the volunteers were, were not research uh, subjects, we asked them to be in touch with the person they were matched with at least four times a month. And two could be on the phone. We'd like the other two to be in person. And what I have here is what we're just calling dose in terms of how much time they spent with each other. And there was a wide, wide range. So you can see on average, there were two phone calls a month between the dyads. They usually spent about 31 minutes on the phone. Only one meeting, so less in person, um, and about two hours together. But what you can see on the bottom row is the range. So wide, wide variability in terms of what these dyads did. Some had up to six phone calls a month. They might have spent <coughs> excuse me, three hours on the phone. Some people spent 20 hours together in a week. Um, and in terms of activities, some went uh, golfing, some chatted over tea, some even went dancing. So a lot of variability in terms of what they did. Um, and some of them uh, are staying in touch. They've really become part of each other's lives. So what I'm going to show here are some uh, results and what we found. So the PHQ-9, many of you may know, is a measure of depressive symptomatology, ranges from 0 to 27. <laughs> Uh, subjects did not have to be depressed to be in the study. So you can see the blue bars 
are the what the groups reported at baseline. So mild symptoms of depression, both groups around an eight and a half. And then you see the, the yellowish bars, those are the follow-up at one year. So both groups improved, but we did find that those randomized to TSC, which is the companionship, those are the bars on the left, had a bigger drop than those in the control condition. So we did find a significant effect on depression, which was good to see. And then I'll show you on the next one, we found the same effect for anxiety, so on the GAD7. So those who received companionship had a larger drop in anxiety than those who did not. So what's really nice about this is that this is a relatively low-cost intervention already offered nationwide. Um, so the effects are somewhat small, but uh, I will say, too, these are intent-to-treat analyses. So we did include everyone who was randomized in the analysis. So I'm going to go to our last poll. Uh, because I was only able to show you some of the results based on time. But I do want to do that poll briefly because it's a really interesting, interesting uh, outcome. So I didn't show you the results for belonging initially because of time. And then I thought better of it. I thought we should discuss it. So what do you think? What's your prediction? Did the individuals who received a companion, so the people in the senior connection condition, did they report higher belonging than controls? And it's just the at follow-up. So at one year follow-up, did those who received a companion <coughs> report higher belonging? So overwhelming majority uh, thinks that the intervention was effective with regards to belonging, that those who received a companion reported better belonging. OK. So that's actually not what we found. Uh, we definitely predicted that. That was actually kind of the main point of the study. Uh, but interestingly, we found that both groups improved on belonging. So we you know, sort of shook our heads at that and had to think for a moment. But then if you are familiar with the suicide prevention literature, our first randomized trial that ever showed an effect on suicide deaths uh, is referred to as the caring letter study, where they took individuals who had attempted suicide <clears throat> and were in the hospital and then refused follow-up care and they sent them postcards every couple of months for a while. Uh, and the postcards were tailored. They just they had the name, and they said, you know what? We're thinking about you. If you want to get in touch, feel free. And they found that fewer people died by suicide who received the postcards than those who did not. So really, really minimal intervention that showed a really powerful effect. And so it's interesting to consider <coughs> that when you do these research studies, even your control group is getting something. And in this case, they were basically getting our most potent intervention for suicide, which is connectedness. So I didn't mention, but we did repeated uh, assessments. So everyone, we interviewed them at baseline, three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. So they were getting to talk to the same assessor every three months. Um, and, you know, I sometimes listen to these interviews and I would hear, oh, Mrs. Jones, how are you? And, you know, of course, we had great uh, people stayed in the study. Uh, but we, we also may have been increasing belongingness just by the fact of doing our research study. So interesting hypothesis. Um, there's many, many other explanations, but in the interest of time, I will keep going. Um, but I will briefly say that for the other interpersonal theory variable about feeling like a burden, we did see a significant effect whereby those who received a companion were less likely to feel like a burden on people in their life than those who um, were, did not receive a companion. And that was really helpful to see. We were worried ahead of time. Um, we wanted to make sure that individuals who had those feelings of burdensomeness didn't also transfer that to their companion. And we did not find that to be, be the case. OK, so we'll move ahead to the next intervention. So I'll go back to the slides. And um, we will talk about another one, because not all of the people we spoke to uh, wanted a companion. So what if our friend Ed won't let a volunteer come visit him? which is a very, very likely <coughs> scenario. So uh, a study I'm doing now is very similar to the one I just described, but the subjects are now the volunteers. 
So it's the same dyad, um, older people connecting with other older people, but now we're studying volunteering. And what you can see there on the right is a quotation from one of our really active volunteers in the Senior Connection Study, who's just fantastic and really articulate about the fact that he felt like he really got something out of providing companionship, that after retirement, he felt a bit isolated um, and really felt engaged with his community, with his life, with others by serving as a volunteer. So now we're testing that hypothesis. Um, and we're in the first year of a five-year study looking at volunteering. So there's a lot of data linking volunteering in later life to lots of really great health outcomes. Um, a lot of it is uh, correlational, not uh, randomized trials, and really hasn't been focused on in terms of the social outcomes. So we're hoping to find some great results with that as well. So stay tuned in about five years. I'll give you the results of this one. Again, showing that it's a randomized trial. We're taking individuals who feel lonely based on a questionnaire that does not use the word loneliness and randomly assigning them to be a senior core volunteer or to do self-guided life review, which is intended to produce expectancies of benefit, engage people for a year, but not change their perceptions of loneliness or belonging. But what if, if Ed is feeling really quite depressed and his depression is really feeding his isolation and we've got this downward cycle and despite the care manager suggesting that he volunteer, uh, he's just really not motivated to get out of the house. So another project I did was, was designed to target um, that type of problem where people might also be feeling depressed. And what we did here was examine a psychotherapy. It's called Engage developed by my colleagues George Alexopoulos and Pat Arian uh, to be a behavioral psychotherapy that's kind of out of the problem-solving therapy literature, but is, is even easier to implement than problem-solving therapy, and is also grounded in what we know about the neurobiology of depression in later life, um, and designed to really target some of those mechanisms. So ENGAGE itself is uh, a bit like behavioral activation. Um, you help people uh, engage in pleasant activities, um, physical activities, or social activities. Uh, for this study, um, I limited it to just social. You can see there the hypothesis is that we wanted to test was, if we increase social engagement, can we change individuals' perceptions of belonging and feeling like a burden, and thereby reduce their suicide risk? So in order to make that happen, uh, we had people focus on the social activities. And again, this was a randomized trial. They had to either endorse loneliness or feeling like a burden, just like in that senior connection trial. Um, and for that one, we used uh, self-reported, I feel lonely, I feel like a burden. So you can see our descriptives there. It's a relatively small study. Um, most older adults did live alone. You can see quite a wide range in age. So from 60 all the way up to about 93. Um, some still married, some divorced, some widowed, um, and unfortunately not a very uh, racially or ethnically diverse sample. And what I have for you on the next slide is something that, that my team and I were really proud of. We had a great uh, number complete all the assessments. We had 92% stay with us in the study, and the vast majority of people who were assigned to the ENGAGE protocol, completed all the sessions. And uh, this was nice to see because it was quite a long protocol. We had them do 10 sessions. We did offer them in the home so that those who could not get to the clinic could still um, participate. And we had them do 10 sessions focused solely on social engagement. Now, people could do physical activities, we would just encourage them to do it in a way that was social. For example, walking with a friend. So people actually really liked this. Um, the therapists who were on the trial really enjoyed doing it because the older adults enjoyed doing it as well. Uh, they really um, sort of enjoyed the process together and, and solving this type of, of problem. So we were able to get good results in that in terms of feasibility. So what I have here are just a couple examples of the work that these older adults did in the sessions. 
So the main tool of Engage is called an action planner. So it's a bit like a problem-solving therapy worksheet. It just kind of is a bit simpler. So you can see there's no problem. You just jump to the goal. Um, and so I call this one Baby Steps because there was a wide range in how socially connected our subjects were. Some were very, very isolated. And so this individual was one of those people and was very uncomfortable making this change. So we didn't you know, have her start out by joining a choir. Uh, we started with a small step, which is just being around people. So you can see people uh, brainstorm ideas for meeting the goal, answer some yes or no questions that help get at pros and cons. If needed, we engage a barrier strategy. And the idea there is uh, that this sort of simple action planning process may not work for everyone if, for example, they have a lot of negative thoughts when they're depressed or maybe a lot of apathy that tends to go with depression in later life. So we target some of those um, factors. And in this case, uh, we had her put her action plan up on the refrigerator so that she would see it. And then the steps, the number five, the steps, you get very concrete. Pick exactly when and where you're going to do these things, again, to help with inertia. So um, depression symptom severity, these are the results. Um, I will mention that there were um, other areas people could focus on. So some worked on family conflict. Uh, some worked on um, exercising with others, all kinds of different ways that people were able to use this. Um, action plan to help, and it was very tailored to what was leading to isolation in that person. So we've had good results. Um, engage when it is focused more broadly on different types of pleasant activities is effective for depression. And we found in this study that when you were focused on just social activities, you also found a reduction in depression, which is nice to see because if you, you know, when you work clinically with older people, I know I've seen and many people have seen that uh, social activation is kind of the last one people pick because it's hard. So we were glad to see that people were willing to hang in there with this and that they felt better. Uh, this is um, behavioral activation, a social scale. So what we're seeing here are self-report of behaviors um, in terms of getting out and being around people. Um, and this, you can see there, the engage is the black line. I should have mentioned last time. And the care as usual is the gray line. So you can see in care as usual, they stayed about the same. There was a slight increase for those in engage in terms of being more behaviorally activated uh, socially at the end of treatment. And then what we see here is suicide ideation. So higher on the uh, y-axis is more ideation. So we want to see drops. And so you can see that the care as usual is pretty flat, whereas those in the black line, which is engaged, had a pretty decent drop in the severity of suicidal thinking. So very promising in terms of potentially being able to reduce suicide risk with a very simple psychotherapy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this in um, interest of time, but I find these results really fascinating. So this is the short form of the UCLA Loneliness Scale. It's just three questions. Um, it's designed to be used in, in larger studies when you don't have a lot of time. Um, and what we're seeing here is UCLA scores where higher is more lonely from baseline three weeks, six weeks, and 10 weeks, which is the end of treatment. So what really I think pops out is that, and no, this is not a mistake, those in Engage who got the psychotherapy are reporting higher levels of loneliness at each time point. Now, I will tell you this interaction where you test if that's significant was, uh, was not significant. It was, it was borderline. So uh, we don't want to overinterpret this. At the same time, these results here really fit with all, what all of the therapists were hearing from the patients, which is that they would say, wow, I had never really thought about feeling lonely or how connected I was. They became much more aware of these feelings. Um, which is, of course, necessary before you can change something. Uh, but 10 weeks uh, seem to be enough time to start to change your behavior, but it likely takes a lot more time to change relationships, to feel really connected. So our hypothesis right now is that it may take more time to see changes in these perceptions. So that's what I have here. Um, these are some uh, quotes from individuals in the study 
um, who I think in particular that last bullet point is interesting. I'm not as much of a loner as I thought. I'm more influenced by people around me than I realized. Or the, the first one, I really do want and need communication with people. You know, so some folks started out saying like, you know, this just isn't really that important to me. And as we talked about it, um, there was, there's quite a bit of shift in there. So that may account in part for why we saw improvements in depression, but not improvements in loneliness. People also really enjoyed the action plan. It's very simple, but it was uh, it, it really helps with things like inertia. You can see that last quote, um, an individual who had lost his wife, the action plans really got him going. So let's say Ed does well with Engage, and this did happen with, with some that we worked with, um, was willing to go to a senior center, but then it didn't go well. So maybe his ability to connect with people might be getting in the way. So this, this next um, intervention I'm going to talk to you about targets nonverbal communication. So we noted that it's essential for forming and maintaining positive, supportive relationships. You know, there's a ton of literature in social psychology showing that when someone's words are discrepant from, say, their face, we believe the face. We believe the nonverbal behaviors. So when you have difficulties with those, maybe from depression, um, it communicates a lot to other people. And we know up to 20% of community-dwelling older adults do have difficulties with nonverbal communication, like smiling, like eye contact, having an expressive face. So um, this study I'm going to go through um, and uh, kind of illustrate the design of it. I do have a video to show um, what it's about. But we have people engage um, with a computer avatar. And so what you see on the left is um, the subject who that we do get permission to, to use these videos. And then on the right is the avatar that this person was having a conversation with. And then what happens is uh, the avatar asks questions, the person engages, and then based on their behavior when they're answering the question, we give the subject feedback based on, you know, it could be, Try to improve your <coughs> eye contact. Try to smile a bit more. We also give positive feedback on things they're doing well. And so here are some examples. Um, uh, we give feedback if they're doing well. We give some feedback if they could improve. Um, and they do several different conversations. They're short, a couple minutes long, um, within each session. And um, the whole thing lasts about, I guess, 20 minutes. So they do about four conversations. And then at the end, we have them get final integrated feedback where we tell them overall. So what we'll do here, I will, hopefully it's a very short video, um, and I'm going to play it in just a second. But what you're seeing here um, is a person who um, then gets, she gets feedback about being a bit negative in her speech. So go ahead and um, play this one if we can do that. Or do I need to do that? Okay, Absolutely. Great. And please note that all of the video audio will be coming through your computer speakers. What are things do you do to be around other people? Oh, almost everything is focused about around being around other people. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I still teach dyslexia. Children or grandchildren. Yes, I have a son and a daughter-in-law, and they live in Portland, Oregon, which is too far away, but that's where they are. And I do not have grandchildren. I have a grand dog, a German Shepherd. OK. Um. Hopefully you all were able to hear that. That was um, one of our subjects who graciously allowed us to, to share that. Um, and what you were seeing there was um, that even subtle uh, changes take place for many people within one of their sessions with this avatar. So what you saw here is that this individual, if you couldn't hear it, I'll tell you the kind of cool part, is uh, she was asked if she has grandchildren. Um, and then uh, when she was given 
the feedback, you know what, try to focus on the positive a bit more. She said, no, I, I don't have grandchildren. And then she kind of caught herself and she said, but I have a grand dog. It's a really nice illustration of how, um, say you were at a senior center and someone brought up that question, how you can go down a negative uh, pathway or a positive one. Uh, so we did see changes even within um, a single session. So that's what we're seeing here. The colors are a bit off, but you can see that all these lines are, are pretty much going up. And what they're showing is that um, we did four conversations, and on average, people improved in all of those different behaviors. Uh, they did not improve in eye contact, which we figured out was due to the fact that uh, the participants weren't sure where to look. They were supposed to look at the avatar or at the webcam. So we have cleared that up. And now we're doing a study where we are having people engage with the program multiple times in their home to see if we can see even bigger effects. So um, I'm going to end with kind of a way to, to wrap up thinking about ways that we can increase social connectedness. So I should have mentioned that there, there's a lot of data linking social connectedness to health and well-being but very little showing us how we can increase it. There are lots of small studies connected with older people and some with younger people that have shown effects on social connectedness, but they were often group interventions, um, not a manualized type intervention, so it's very hard to replicate. Um, none have been replicated. Um, and as well, very small sample sizes. There is one meta-analysis, if you're interested, um, by John Cassiopo's group. Unfortunately, John did recently pass away. Um, a meta-analysis looking at interventions for loneliness. Their takeaway was that interventions that target social cognition, kind of like belonging or feeling like a burden, may be the most effective way to go. I do have some, I have some different interpretations of that data, but I do agree that can be one way to go. But we really, none of those interventions are ones that we know reliably work. So what I'm hoping that I can contribute to and, and others um, is really coming up with some solid ways that we can disseminate to older people to increase connectedness. And what this slide is showing is that you know, there are multiple pathways to disconnection or isolation to loneliness. And so we hopefully will be able to tailor those intervention strategies to um, the risk factors for an individual older person. For example, perhaps someone can't drive anymore and they're homebound, and so they can't get out and be around people. So addressing transportation, really hard one, but uh, that's a, something that we could at least work towards being able to address for older people. Um, peer companionship, maybe social skills. Um, senior centers might address uh, people who uh, just don't have those uh, connections. So we know the gerontological literature shows that older people tend to have uh, reduced their social networks over time to prune um, and really focus on improving the quality of ones that they have. But that doesn't take into account um, older people who have been isolated a long time who may need to increase connections. So I think our, our models will also need to incorporate what we know about development in later life helping some interventions that should be able to help people improve relationships they have, as well as some that may help people develop new relationships. Um, someone may have moved to a retirement community and needs to really develop relationships there. Um, so I think care management also plays a really big role in this in helping people get connected to some of the community services that may help reduce social isolation. So just to pull it all together, uh, positive connections that involve feeling cared about and contributing to others' lives may, in fact, save lives through suicide prevention as well as all-cause mortality. Um, future work should really look at um, the amount of time it takes to really change those perceptions of connectedness. And then understanding pathways to isolation and feeling like a burden so that we can tailor strategies to fit individuals, um, and also understand the way these things are working so that we can, when we take them from research out into the community, make sure that we know how to make them work. So I think I have gotten through everything uh, at that point. So there's my email address if, you, um, if we don't end up getting to your question. Uh, but I think at this point, we, can, we have about up to 30 minutes for questions. And um, 
I will take those and do my best to answer them. Thank you, Kim. Okay, I'll ask a few now. Here's one from Peter. Um, oh, sorry, that's more of a comment. Let's get to another one. Okay, from John. You stated that suicide is not an expected or normal response to the stresses of aging. How many older people can contemplate suicide? Not following through can be the result of many reasons, protected factors. So his yeah. question was, how many older people contemplate suicide? Sure. So again, just as I was talking about um, loneliness and how common it is, same thing with, with suicide ideation, depending on how we uh, define it. So they can vary from passive thoughts, wishing you were dead, thoughts that life isn't worth living, all the way up to thinking about ways to kill yourself. And then uh, it depends. So it depends what type of thinking. It also depends where you uh, ask. So a community sample versus primary care and so on. So uh, the rates are not that high. Um, in fact, older people are less likely to report suicide ideation than those at younger ages. Um, the prevalence gets higher as you go to um, more intensive levels of care. So for example, levels of suicide ideation are quite high in long-term care or nursing homes. Um, if you think about primary care, maybe 15% would be at the high end. So it's really not that many people. Um, so I, I don't think it's an issue of there being a lot of protective factors that keep individuals um, from acting on it. Things like it's really quite complicated. I, I'm happy that you brought that question up because it really helps us understand where to intervene, right? So if we know that the issue is uh, lots of suicidal thoughts, then we intervene there. Um, so I think the work that I like to do is just really, if we can prevent people from even thinking about it, um, that is, of course, likely to be life-saving. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sterling. His question is, is isolation among aging populations growing in its frequency? Are there any predictive models of the outlook for the aging baby boomer population as they age? So the first part of that question um, I did talk about in terms of it's really difficult to tell if isolation is becoming more common. Um, in terms of predictive models for isolation and loneliness, I don't know that I am aware of, of that other than what I mentioned about uh, suicide rates. So we can, we do know that baby boomer cohorts and subsequent cohorts are likely to usher in higher suicide rates. From that, you may extrapolate that likely those isolation rates will go up. So it's it's hard to say. Okay. A uh, question from Charles is: What other behavioral health problems may be most responsive to a public health response versus screening, intervention, um, and treatment? Okay, um, so taking kind of a, a public health approach and really addressing it at a population level. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's specific to social connectedness or suicide. You know, I'm, uh, my, my mentors here in Rochester have given us the examples of many other health problems that have been changed. So for example, heart disease. Um, you know, we've changed our public narrative about um, exercise and diet, you know, in part due to advocacy based on um, what we need to do to reduce heart disease. Um, you can think about um, drunk driving. You can think about seat belts, all those types of things where we've really changed at the population level. It tends to be a pretty powerful approach. So I think um, we just don't see suicide often as a uh, something we can target at the public health level. We think about it as something between a psychiatrist and a, and a patient. But the vast majority of people who die by suicide aren't in mental health care. Um, so we need to, in addition to really improving our treatments for mental health, we need to add to that, expand our um, toolbox to help people. Okay. Are there any contributing factors known as to why white men and women are more significantly prone to suicide than any other minority races or, or ethnicities? Again, a really interesting question. Um, I will start by just 
uh, pointing out the, remember that graph we looked at where Native American youth are at astronomical risk for, for suicide. Um, but as you were saying, um, African American men and women are much lower risk. Um, if we look, uh, one of my uh, postdocs who's working with me, uh, Dr. Caroline Silva, is doing work looking at the Hispanic population. And there's a pretty uh, strong risk for suicide attempts among Hispanic youth. And so we're concerned about, as they age and enter higher risk periods, what we might see there. Um, there's a, a lot of people who specialize in uh, looking at suicide risk in African American populations. Um, I, I would defer to some of their work. But I think some of it is um, some of the risk factors in that tend to be, or protective factors that tend to be more common in um, the African American community, such as social connectedness, um, connections with church, things like that. So really, some of the protective factors that may be most potent for suicide risk tend to be more present. Now, it's an interesting issue because a lot of there are a lot of health disparities in other health problems where individuals um, and other racial and ethnic minorities, people with lower SES, there's lots of disparities where they really suffer and get um, less positive outcomes. So it's a, it's a very complicated issue. Um, just to add to that, if you look worldwide, globally, um, vast majority of uh, countries, you see that more men die by suicide than women. That's not true in China. Um, and that's especially um, women tend to die at very high rates in China. So it's, we have to really be careful and specify where we're talking about. Um, culture plays a huge role in suicidal behavior. And it's not something I think that all of our theories of suicide do justice in accounting for. Um, so uh, again, the, the postdoc I'm working with, Dr. Silva, um, is we're doing some, I think, really interesting work. She's helping spearhead this idea of what is connectedness cross-culturally. Um, so social re relationships are conceptualized differently in different cultures. And that may have, in part, to do be one contributor to why suicide rates may vary cross-culturally. We don't know. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question, and it really um, pulls for us to do really rigorous work when we measure these constructs cross-culturally. Uh, cross so is belonging the same thing in China as it is in the US? Probably not. Um, so I think the short answer to your question would have been, we don't really know. Um, there are hypotheses. There's some um, descriptive data suggesting that some of the differences <coughs> may be due to some of the risk and protective factors that are at play. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Mia is, what questionnaire do you use to measure loneliness that does not use the word loneliness? Sure. Um, there are actually a couple scales. Um, the one I tend to use is the UCLA loneliness scale. Um, it asks, the short one asks about uh, if you feel like you lack companionship, um, if you have people, oh goodness, I'm going to forget the other items. Um, they don't mention the word loneliness. It's kind of your perceptions of your relationships. Um, there are a few other scales as well. Um, the AARP website that uh, they have a, a new campaign looking at social connectedness. And they have some good materials on their website, as well as um, one of the UK's Campaign to End Loneliness website. That's a great one. They have a, a PDF that you can download that describes, I believe, four or five different measures of loneliness, um, gives brief background, and then actually has the measures themselves. So those may be of interest. Um, they're, they're shorter measures that you can use, um, even if you have limited time. Um, and then the measure of belonging is one that I developed called the Interpersonal Needs Questionnaire. Um, and it talks about uh, feeling like you belong, as well as feeling like a burden on others. Okay. Uh, a question from Chad is, aside from belonging and perceived burden, what other factors have been found to impact reasoning? Reasoning for suicide, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we're talking about. Um, so in terms of internal perceptions, um, hopelessness is a big one. 
Um, and so the interpersonal theory um, includes hopelessness in the model, um, but specifies that hopelessness about your relationships is especially problematic. So not just general hopelessness, but when you feel like you're always going to not belong, you're always going to be a burden, becomes a problem. But you know, any type of hopelessness about a situation that's not going to get better is definitely a problem and should be targeted. Um, feelings of low self-worth, um, all the stuff, the negative thinking that goes with depression. And then the constellation of risk factors that I mentioned for older adults, in addition to depression, um, is functional impairment. And so that may cause perceptions of feeling like a burden, um, as well as uh, declines in physical health, um, declines in um, functioning is a big one, uh, as well as physical pain. Um, and for, um, for older people, the data linking cognitive impairment to suicide is very complex. We need a lot more work there. Uh, dementia is not linked to increased suicide risk. It may be because suicide, dying by suicide, is very hard to do, like I mentioned with the idea of capability. And when you have lost a lot of abilities to plan, things like that, uh, dying by suicide um, is, is difficult. Uh, there is some data suggesting that uh, more milder versions of cognitive impairment may increase risk. We're not really sure what those mechanisms are, but it definitely makes sense when someone starts to be impaired, maybe gets a diagnosis of MCI or um, mild dementia, to, to look out for them, to, to ask. Um, it's a good time to point out that there is lots and lots of research showing that asking about suicide is very safe. It's not going to put the idea in someone's head. It's not going to cause them to think about suicide. Um, many people are relieved. And in particular, if you're working clinically with older adults, they're very unlikely to spontaneously tell you, I'm thinking of suicide. Really important as mental health professionals, people working with older adults, to directly ask, uh, to use the word suicide, um, to, to not skirt around the issue. So if you use the PHQ-9, um, it has that question. It's, it's kind of it's, it's vague. It, it doesn't directly ask about suicide. So you know, if you get a response to that, follow up. Are you having suicidal thoughts? Are you having thoughts of killing yourself? Um, very important question to ask um, and can be life-saving. Great. Thank you. Um, a question we have from Monique is, do you mm -hmm. find your stats and research mirror veteran suicide rates? Mm, great question. So do, uh, does the work I've described here um, apply to veterans as well? Um, I think um, in large part, uh, yes, and there's always caveats, of course, um, and it's helpful to have research specific to veterans to make sure it works there, especially when we're talking about interventions where they have such, um, veterans in care with the VA have such a different system um, and access to care. So making sure our interventions work in those different systems is important. Um, I think in terms of some of the risk factors, uh, you know, some important work by Matt Nock and colleagues looking at, you know, types of anxiety disorders, types of psychopathology that increase risk for suicidal thoughts versus suicidal behavior. And things like PTSD, where it's activating and involves agitation, are pretty strongly linked to suicidal behavior as opposed to depression, which is really just linked to thinking. So I think there are a lot of um, issues uh, that veterans are more common in veterans uh, that are very important to address for suicide risk. Um, and I think the VA, does, you know, they do a great job rolling out evidence-based interventions, um, which can be a real, real asset. And they're doing phenomenal work with uh, the suicide prevention coordinators who are in each of those medical centers to connect those veterans at risk for suicide. Question from Holly is, has Skype come up as a possibility to use in nursing facilities to make a connection to family who are distance, who are, I'm sorry, who are a distance away? Yeah, that's a, a great question. It's, it's such, uh, there's so much technology we could try to make use of. Um, I was just at a conference uh, the other day where someone was presenting on her work using this type of technology where um, it was, it was neat. It wasn't just um, live Skype, but the family 
would make videos and choose other videos, and it would just play nonstop pretty much on the TV. The old person could turn it off, but they pretty much, um, they also had some that could, the staff could program. So if someone got agitated, the family said, try video A, and they would play that one, and it would be something like a grandchild talking to them. Um, so I think there's tons of great uh, ideas and possibilities for that. I, I think we're just in the beginning points of figuring out how to actually make it practical, how to get people connected with it, how to help people feel more comfortable. So a lot of potential there. Um, I, there's also kind of related data showing that you know social media is not a replacement. Um, I know you said Skype, which is, of course, connecting with, with real people. But important to mention that the social media may be in addition to um, real connect face to face to face connectedness with with other people um, so I think you know one thing to point out as well is that um, as we we move forward uh, we're seeing more and more older people having uh, smartphones being engaged with technology so I think it will also be something that evolves over time um, starting to use things like Lyft and uber uh, are great. I had a patient who um, became homebound due to Huntington's disease who now is able to use Lyft. Um, you know, our, 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 we have services to get people to medical appointments, but not to social events, which are actually just as important for their health. So in, in, to make a short answer really long, yes, I think that there are some great opportunities for technology, and people are conducting those studies, and hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll start seeing them get rolled out. Great. Thank you. Where does suicide factor, where does suicide factor into hospice care? Ah, okay. Another really interesting, interesting topic where we think about... Uh, sort of the idea of um, advanced illness. Um, when we think about things like uh, physician-assisted suicide, um, end-of-life issues, very, very interesting, very complicated. Um, and it's, a lot of it comes down to ethics and what people, um, what people resonates for them. I will tell you there's quite a bit of data showing that Individuals with advanced illness who request physician-assisted suicide or report that they would request physician-assisted suicide, uh, the same risk factors predict that decision as do suicidal thoughts in most cases. So um, very similar constellation of risk factors for those two, uh, two thoughts, um, which is interesting, um, only because it suggests that uh, we may be that it's a type of distress that we may be, may be able to address, for example. So feeling like a burden uh, or fear of becoming a burden is a big one um, in people with advanced illness. And you know there are some interventions that look promising for that. Um, there's interventions like dignity therapy that was designed to be uh, delivered with individuals nearing the end of life, where you sort of help people make sense of their lives, of their relationships, things like that. Um, that may be able to um, improve quality of life and to uh, reduce risk for, for suicide. We know that uh, older adults in the U.S. who die by suicide, um, older white men tend to die via firearm, which is a traumatic death for the family, for everyone involved. Um, and so the same risk factors predict that as, as tend to predict um, physician-assisted suicide request. And so I think you bring up um, a really important point, which is that hospice and palliative care may in and of itself be a suicide prevention intervention. If we can help people uh, suffer less, have a better quality of life at the end of life, um, people may be uh, less fearful, may dread the end of life uh, less, um, and may be able to have some, some meaningful quality of life near the end of life. Thank you. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so we'll ask maybe two or three more questions, just depending on the length of the question. What are good resources slash programs to help connect aging individuals with companionship? You mentioned Senior Corps. Are there any others? With companionship, um, so your local area agency on aging, um, their statewide 
programs uh, will typically have, um, they'll have information about those types of programs. Um, some faith communities have programs like that. Um, I know there's something called Stephen Ministries where uh, lay people do go out and connect um, with individuals who are struggling, including those who are homebound. Um, so faith communities is a good one. Um, and then the Area Agency on Aging, even if they don't administer a program, should have information about where you can get someone connected with that type of program. Okay. Is there work on building relationships between older adults with youth as an intervention for decreasing isolation? Yeah, great question. So there were um, a series of really amazing, strong studies on a program called the Experience Core. They were initially done in Baltimore. And it's a program that took older adults and placed them as volunteers in Baltimore City schools. And they would volunteer in the classroom doing things like, um, like extra tutoring for reading, for example. They were kind of like aides in the classroom. Um, that had amazing outcomes in terms of, excuse me, disability physical functioning, and cognitive functioning. So these were people who were relatively healthy, but they uh, had amazing gains um, over time. I will say that this program uh, was very intensive. They required about 15 hours a week for a year. Quite a lot for volunteering. So um, it's uh, hard to say if that fully generalizes to a lot of the programs out in the community now that older people tend to um, to use. So for the study I'm doing, four is the most we would expect from someone to do. Um, as well, the Experience Core study, one of its really, really important strengths was that they were able to recruit a lot of ethnic and racial minorities. I think the most of the sample were, were African American women, which is a really underserved underserved group. At the same time, in terms of isolation and suicide risk, we know that older white men are, are demographic at higher, highest risk. So it's hard to say if that intervention would have impacted um, isolation and uh, suicide risk. They, they didn't ask many questions about isolation and social connectedness. Um, there were a few questions that looked like that people did improve on that, but it's hard to say. Um, there were questions about generativity, where you feel like you're giving back to other people, and those improved. Um, and in terms of programs that are out there, one of the senior core programs is called Foster Grandparents, where older adults are paired with um, a youth in the community. And it's not, I don't believe in the schools, I believe it's more of a like big brother, big sister, where you um, hang out, spend time together. Um, and I will say that both, I think that program as well as the senior companion program tend to be income based. So to qualify as a volunteer, the older person has to have lower income because they are provided a stipend. Um, there is a third program in the senior corps, however, called RSVP, Retired, Retired Senior Volunteer Program. And that can be for individuals of any income. And they help place older adults with community agencies that need a volunteer that could benefit from their help. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, I think a lot of times some of the people, older people in primary care who need these interventions aren't necessarily the ones who will seek them out. So people who may be feeling lonely or bad about themselves or isolated may not be the ones who are able to reach out to engage. Um, so it's my hope that we can really get primary care connected with these resources as one way um, to get people connected. And also um, all of our great mental health care workers um, making sure that everyone's up to date on what the programs are so that we can get isolated older people uh, connected with those programs. Thank you. What is the best way to engage with the most isolated and resistant older adults? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, so a tricky, I'm guessing what you mean by resistant would be resistant to change, resistant to um, being willing to um, go out in the community, for example. Um, I think in that case, it might be most useful to use some sort of behavioral strategy that helps address that resistance. So likely that older person 
you know, has, has a reason for that. Maybe they're frightened. Maybe they've had difficult experiences. Um, and so something doesn't have to be engaged, but engaged, for example, did help a lot with those types of barriers. So it was really effective with people who were in senior living communities but did not want to use the activities available to them. So, you know, there's the yoga class or there might be a speaker coming in, a book club, and they didn't want to go. And then Engage helped them take advantage of what was there for them, um, whether it was their reluctance to own the fact that they were older and in a senior living community. Maybe they were depressed. Maybe they had lost um, a spouse and just sort of gave up on life. So I, I got to be a therapist on the trial, and one of my uh, most favorite uh, clients was about 92 um, and started spending his action plan kept being going for a walk with the same woman in his community over and over again. And he was getting so much better. His depression score went down to zero. And so one day I asked him, I knew the answer, but if I, I asked him, you know, what do you think um, accounted, accounts for you feeling better? And he kind of smiles and he's like, Kim, I got a girlfriend. You know, it was just one of those really cool moments where he had given up on life. He wasn't going down to get dinner. He was taking dinner in his room. Um, now he had started some sort of card game group so that he could teach her how to play. Um, and it was just neat to see someone reconnect and find some joy in his life when he thought it was he wouldn't have anymore. So I think strategies uh, that, that help address that motivation, so not just telling someone you need to go do this, but really helping figure out why they're not doing it, what they're scared of, what they're worried about. Um, and really helping them find the motivation to to re-engage, um, to overcome that resistance. Um, so I mean, I've done things where a gentleman was just had been socially anxious his whole life and was just terrified. So we started small, like I had with the baby steps uh, slide, where he went and um, <clears throat> went to a, a nursery and bought some plants. You know, he was around people and he asked a question of someone about a plant. And, you know, that, that planted the seed and literally, oh, that was a nice pun, planted the seed for him to really change his life. So, I, you know, it's a, a real, one of my favorite things about working with older people is just the courage that we see in being willing to make big changes in your life um, when you've been living a certain way for a long time. Uh, it's really a privilege. And I think um, that idea that older people may not be willing to change uh, we, we get proven wrong a lot about that one, and I think that's one of the, the biggest joys of this work. Great. Let's ask one more question. What recommendations do you have to encourage social connections for people who live in largely rural community with minimal resources available? Oh, boy. All right. So one of the toughest issues. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll go out with that one. Um, so. You know, I've, I've talked about how face-to-face -face is likely the best thing. Um, at the same time, you know, we do with what we can. Um, there are phone programs. So in my community, our largest aging services provider um, is implementing a, uh, it's a companionship program, but it's all via the phone. Um, it's kind of a friendship line. And um, older people are matched with a, kind of a phone friend, and they touch base, hopefully to reduce loneliness. Um, that's one way. Um, in terms of other strategies people can use, say if you're working with a therapist, um, a lot of the folks I worked with who were unable to drive would do things like uh, write letters. You know, we don't do that as much anymore. Um, so all kinds of creative ways to maintain the connections they do have, um, as well as using whatever resources are there, meals on wheels, any types of things like that that get people connected. Um, and there, there are call lines, even if your agency may not have one in the area. Um, there are some where you can call from, from anywhere, and those are a good resource. Um, and then finally, if the person is isolated and thinking of suicide, um, absolutely, the National Suicide Prevention Crisis Line is a very powerful resource. So that's available 24 hours a day, no matter where you are. Uh, it's 1-800-273-TALK. And you can call them any time of day. They're confidential. Um, unless someone is at imminent risk, they will call rescue services. 
Um, so I make sure all the folks I work with do have that number. Um, and if they need someone to talk to in the middle of the night, they can call that. But I think it's, it's a really important point that we need to start addressing this issue in rural areas uh, because it is such, I mean, it's a place where it's compounded, um, where that physical isolation is compounded. So we have a lot of work to do in this area, and I'm really optimistic that we can make a difference with so many of you being interested to be on this webinar today and to start a conversation about this topic. So I really appreciate you tuning in, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Orden. Uh, we did have a lot of questions, and unfortunately, we could not get to all of them. However, I will download them and send them along with your email address to Dr. Van Orden so that she can respond to you directly. Um, again, thank you so much for your presentation today, Kim. And I would also like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today. I'm going to switch the screen to a short evaluation and ask that you take some time to fill this out for us, letting us know how you enjoyed today's webinar. Again, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.